On Halloween this year, actor Kit Connor briefly returned to Twitter after a short hiatus and posted this tweet. Back for a minute, I'm bye. Congrats for forcing an 18 year old to out himself. I think some of you missed the point of the show. Bye. How the hell did we get to a point where a teenager felt pressured into coming out publicly to stave off harassment? Let's dive into this story and the obsessive world of queer speculation to uncover its motives and its dangers. Kit Connor plays one of the leads in the new Netflix series Heartstopper based on the enormously popular webcomic and graphic novels of the same name by Alice Oseman. His character Nick starts a story unsure about his sexuality but soon realises that he's bisexual. By the end of the first series of the show he's come out to his friends and his mum and his dating fellow high school student Charlie. Nick knows he likes girls but it isn't really until he starts to fall for Charlie that he begins to figure out his attraction to boys too. Him specifically being bisexual is a big part of his character and from the Pirates of the Caribbean induced by panic to the bisexual flag coloured lighting, the show is very clear about his sexuality. During the casting of the show, the open casting calls were also clear about the queer nature of the series, including a line, Needless to say, we would like to ensure performers from the LGBTQIA plus community feel inspired to apply along with allies to our community. After the show came out, a number of the young stars talked about their sexualities and gender identities, including Joe Locke, who plays Charlie, Sebastian Sebastian Croft, who plays Charlie's ex Ben, and Kizzy Edgel, who plays Charlie and Nick's friend Darcy. Comments on their own experiences, journeys, and thoughts on representation became part of the discussion around the show itself. However, it's important to note that it wasn't a prerequisite of their roles in the show to be this open about their sexualities or genders. It just seems to be something that they wanted to talk about. However, the fact that Kit Connor hadn't commented on his own sexuality drew attention from people who, it turns out, decided that they had the right to know how he identified. The fact that he had also played a queer role previously in his career as a young Elton John in the movie Rocket Man only stoked this online speculation. Due to this scrutiny, Connor took to Twitter earlier in 2022 to address this, tweeting, Twitter is so funny, man. Apparently some people on here know my sexuality better than I do. In the summer, he spoke with W Magazine about it too, explaining that his boundaries were important, even though he understands people's enthusiasm for authentic representation, telling the report People can get a bit too comfortable on social media. If I haven't said anything, you shouldn't assume anything, but you also shouldn't pressure me to tell people. It's a very personal journey that people have to go on. It seems pretty clear. Connor could not have been putting out more signs that he was not comfortable with the public speculation. Like he says, don't do it, please. Yep. It continued. He's talked about the effect of this wave of negativity, people not just speculating but criticising him for either taking a queer role from a queer actor or not publicly coming out in a kind of harassment catch-22. He's talked about the phenomenon of psychologically you almost want to seek out the bad things people say about you. It's like if you overhear your name after you leave a room or you see a private message about yourself, there's that morbid curiosity, that element of psychological self-flagellation that can reel you in. Luckily, he says, he almost fell into that spiral, but decided to delete Twitter instead, calling it the best decision of his life. Social media is not a window into my soul at all. In many ways, it's great, but as someone who's in the public eye, if you look for people saying bad stuff about you, you'll find it. Everyone wants to be liked, which is slightly heartbreaking when you're in the position of someone like me or Joe Locke. He also talked about this on a podcast back in May, saying, We're still all so young. To start sort of speculating about our sexualities and maybe pressuring us to come out when maybe we're not ready. For me, I just feel perfectly confident and comfortable with my sexuality, but I don't feel the need to really, you know, I'm not too big on labels and things like that. I'm not massive about that. I don't feel like I need to label myself, especially not publicly. It feels a bit strange to make assumptions about a person's sexuality just based on hearing their voice or seeing their appearance. I feel like that's a very interesting, slightly problematic sort of assumption to make. Like, not to over egg this, but here he is again over the summer talking about the same issues, still asking people to maybe consider, you know, the nuance of the situation in Hunter magazine. I don't feel like I have to tell the world about my sexuality. I completely understand that many fans want queer representation to be authentic and that they want to know whether it is authentic. But at the same time, you shouldn't make someone feel uncomfortable to the point where they have to tell a stranger about their sexuality. So clearly this is something that Connor has been having to deal with pretty much since the casting was revealed. But especially 
especially once the show dropped and gained even more popularity. So what was the breaking point that got him to post on Halloween? For a while, there had been an air of speculation and rumor, people either deciding Connor was straight and criticizing him for taking on a queer role because of that, or else insisting that he was really gay and hiding it. Both of these, of course, being entirely based on nothing that had come from Connor himself, because as we've just seen up until that point, his decision was to remain unlabeled. Although in the tweet from Halloween, Connor doesn't specify why he felt he was forced to come out, I think the reason becomes clearer if we look at how he'd been treated online by users immediately prior to this tweet. The word queer baiting began to be increasingly thrown around, a word I've covered extensively on this channel before. Queer baiting is when a TV show or movie will hint at queerness within a script, performances, marketing, or subtext, but never officially confirm it on screen. This is largely accepted to be a marketing practice, the idea being that you can draw in queer audiences who will accept basically crumbs, clinging on to the hope that it would eventually be made explicit in the show, while also not alienating conservative audiences who wouldn't watch an openly queer story. For years, it was a frustrating practice because it felt impossible to prove it was happening. After all, while a show was on the air, there was always a chance that it would end up being queer, right? And who could say if it was a deliberate ploy or just queer fans reading too much into it? But more recently, we've had writers come out and talk about how queerness was curtailed to just below the surface by execs, and increasingly evident examples surface like the infamous we're on a ship marketing from Teen Wolf. So queer baiting is undeniably a real thing in fictional media. However, applying it to an actor like Kit Connor, who's just living his life, is honestly fundamentally ridiculous. There is no part of a teenage boy simply existing that can be compared to a knowing and manipulative marketing tactic. But those who were accusing him of queer baiting were angry. They were angry with the idea that a celebrity might be benefiting from a closeness to the queer community without actually being a part of it or sharing in its struggles. Except Connor doesn't seem to have done that at all. What did he do to cause such anger and offense? Well, the catalyst of these accusations came after he was seen holding hands with a Cuban girl's guide to tea in Tomorrow's star, Maya Rafiko. Yep, you had that right. The great injustice that he apparently did to the community was to hold hands with a girl. The bi erasure right there feels like more of a danger to the community than any potential straight actor playing a queer role, like surely. And to add to the bitter irony, Maya herself, also bisexual. Because as I'm sure we can all agree, a boy holding hands with a girl, even dating her, doesn't necessarily confirm anything about his specific sexuality. And whether or not Connor is dating this actress, his bisexuality is just as real. Queer baiting is about taking a queer person's need for representation and turning it into profit for a media company. Accusing a real person of queer baiting for merely existing is the opposite of respecting queer people's needs. Those who aren't out have the need for privacy, the need for safety, and the need for understanding. Connor literally plays a bisexual teen coming to term with his sexuality and learning that liking girls doesn't mean he can't also like boys, vice versa in Heartstopper. He experiences harassment from the antagonist of the series. He struggles and cries and finds an accepting community of friends who love him. Importantly, his love interest Charlie is completely supportive of the fact that he isn't ready to come out immediately to the rest of the school or his family. The irony of Connor being harassed for playing this character by supposed fans of the show is tangible. There is literally a scene in the comic where a teacher says, you can't tell whether people are gay by what they look like, and gay or straight aren't the only two options. Anyway, it's very rude to speculate about people's sexuality. So Connor himself is a bisexual teen, and yet the messages of acceptance and love and your identity and coming out being your own damn decision seem to have been completely lost on viewers harassing him. Not only were their skills of media literacy utterly missing, but also their basic sense of empathy, apparently. The Heartstopper team and Connor's co-stars immediately posted their support online. The creator of the webcomic and the show Alice Oseman wrote, I truly don't understand how people can watch Heartstopper and then gleefully spend their time speculating about sexualities and judging based on stereotypes. I hope all those people are embarrassed as f Kit, you are amazing. Joe Locke, who plays Charlie, tweeted, You owe nothing to anyone. I'm so proud of you, my friend. Sebastian Croft, who plays Ben, tweeted, Kit Connor, the world doesn't deserve you. Love you, my friend. And Kizzy Edgel, who plays Darcy, tweeted, I love you, Kit. I'm sorry this has been so disgustingly rough on you. Been treated so unfairly. Also, it shouldn't be this way, but I think that it's unfortunately understandable that on top of the usual worries about coming out, you know, personal comfort with your sexuality being known publicly, concern with how ready you are to take the next step, actors also have this added pressure of their careers to potentially add to the mix. 
There might have been an outpouring of support for Kit on the internet, backlash against what led up to the tweet, but it shouldn't have got to this place at all. Other queer actors like Rupert Everett have talked about the impact that coming out had on their role offers, even those in established careers. For an actor who is as young as Connor, I honestly wouldn't blame him for not announcing his sexuality to the public, even if he was out in the rest of his life privately. Coming out can be a wonderful and joyous process, but it isn't a moral imperative. No one owes you that information about themselves, not even actors in the public eye. It also honestly reduces the rest of the cast's own interviews and posts about their sexualities and gender identities to simply being part of marketing. Allowing queer actors the opportunity to play queer characters is important, but if the consequence is holding them hostage by forcing them to either come out to appease their harassers or forcing them to out and out lie about their sexuality, it isn't being taken with the intended generosity that it should. Gatekeeping access to the community to only those who are out publicly ensures that you leave some of its most vulnerable members out in the cold. But this isn't the first time we've seen celebrities forced to come out or been the subject of public speculation. Not by a long shot. Part one, a brief history of outing. Let's talk about coming out. There's a whole video essay waiting in the wings about the entire history of this queer custom, but for today, let's stick with the ideas of coming out as it relates to public figures and the potential issues and morality that come with it. First, let's talk about coming out as a political statement. The idea that coming out is a political act, an activist statement almost, has a long history, but probably the most famous example of it in action is this speech from Harvey Milk in 1978. Milk was the first openly gay man to be elected to public office in California and was a fascinated the same year that this speech was given. Gay brothers and sisters, you must come out. Come out to your parents. I know that it is hard and will hurt them, but think about how they will hurt you in the voting booth. Come out to your relatives. Come out to your friends, if indeed they are your friends. Come out to your neighbours, to your fellow workers, to the people who work where you eat and shop. Come out only to the people you know and who know you, not to anyone else. But once and for all, break down the myths, destroy the lies and distortions, for your sake, for their sake. This rallying cry was a response to the passing of homophobic laws at the time, and the act of coming out became something that had the power to potentially stop more from passing. The issue at the time was people thinking that they didn't know any queer people at all, that the gay person wasn't their friend or family, but a frightening boogeyman who was entirely other. Milk was all too aware of the possibility of his own murder, recording a tape to be played in the event of his death where he said, I would like to see every gay lawyer, every gay architect come out, stand up and let the world know. That would do more to end prejudice overnight than anybody could imagine. I urge them to do that, urge them to come out. Only that way will we start to achieve our rights. All I ask is for the movement to continue. And if a bullet should enter my brain, let that bullet destroy every closet door. I think that some people who pressure people to come out now have this idea that the sentiment in these speeches, a powerful rallying cry to bravery and solidarity, is a fundamental moral imperative today. That these words, spoken at a very different time during the fight for legal equality, can and should be applied entirely today in the same manner and to everyone. But I would argue that it's the progress done by activists like Harvey Milk that allow queer people today the freedom to decide their own identities and narratives. It's due to them that coming out doesn't have to be something painful that you do to try and claw equality from a society that hates you, but instead something you have agency over. This wasn't a dictator's order. Yes, prejudice exists today still, but it's not our obligation to suffer to try and prevent it. And two, outing as a political act. So outing is essentially revealing their sexuality to the public or at least individuals that didn't previously know without that person's permission. The overwhelming consensus is that doing this to someone is not good. However, there have been instances of this being used as a tactic by activists in the past. In 1991, for example, there was an offshoot of the political group Outrage, which engaged in an outing campaign against public figures who used their platforms to spread homophobia while being gay themselves in private. Outrage was a British organization which described itself as a broad-based group of queers committed to radical, non-violent direct action and civil disobedience and was formed to advocate that lesbian, gay and bisexual people have the same rights as heterosexual people, to end homophobia and to affirm the right of queer people to their sexual freedom, choice and self-determination. The breakaway group involved well-known activist Peter Tatchell, who acted as their contact with the press, passing statements on figures to be outed along to his contacts in the media. Tatchell recently talked about this tactic. I 
regret not using outing earlier and against more homophobes. It proved very effective to stop them in their tracks. After outrage wrote anti-gay MPs in the 90s, most ceased voting against equality. We should have used that tactic much sooner. It was a tiny fragment of our work, but all the same, outrage practiced ethical outing. We never outed anyone because they were gay and in the closet. It was because they were public figures who were abusing their power and influence to attack and harm other gay people. There was a contradiction between their public homophobia and their private homosexuality. It was a clear example of hypocrisy and double standards. It was ethically and morally right to expose them. At one point, the group threatened to out 200 leading figures across industries from politics and religion to business and sports. This culminated in a press conference where they revealed that this campaign had been a hoax, a way to highlight the hypocrisy of the media who criticised these members of outrage for engaging in political outing of specific figures while outing random celebrities themselves for no other reason than selling papers. Again, even if you agree with these controversial methods of outing homophobic politicians who inflict harmful policies and votes onto the public, that is still not comparable to the modern attempted outing of teenage actors. And thirdly, let's talk about the outing of celebrities. So whatever you think of their methods, outrage had a point. Over the years, we've seen many examples of the press contributing to the outing of actors, singers, and other public figures with seemingly no remorse, from paparazzi shots of Portia de Rossi to the tabloid outing of Charles Bono. The connotations of shame and scandal tied up in revealing someone's sexuality still exist today, even though the general climate might be more accepting in many ways. I'm going to look at two well-known singers who have had a lot of queer speculation around them in the next part of the video, Harry Styles and Taylor Swift. But I wanted here to talk about two examples of musicians who've experienced outing in the UK in the past. The first is Stephen Gately, who is a member of the mega popular boy band Boyzone. Fellow band member Shane Lynch has talked about Gately's experiences before and after his outing, saying, Obviously me and the boys always knew Steo was gay. It wasn't a question because his boyfriends used to come on the road with us and stuff. I think in the early 90s when we came to the UK, being a boy band and being gay, nobody had come out. It was just not the thing to do. In the interview, Lynch explained that management wanted it swept under the carpet, which is why the public didn't know about Stephen's sexuality. Shane then said that there was serious efforts made to keep it a secret. There's an understanding amongst celebrities, or whatever you want to call it, but he was meant to be dating Baby Spice and all that. Stephen was given an ultimatum while Boyzone were touring in Germany. He got a phone call to say that the press were going to run with a story on him. He was distraught. They said to him, look, you can tell your story or we're going to print our story. It nearly destroyed him. It really nearly destroyed him. So we have an industry that kept queer young people in the closet, fake relationships to keep up appearances and callous threats of outing in the press. But these issues of the industry would not have been lessened by fan speculation about his sexuality. It would have, in fact, contributed to a situation that nearly destroyed him. However, fan support after he came out was a different story, with Lynch telling reporters, The support he got from our fans, they were the best. From that point, he just flourished. He'd always been that reserved. He grew into this beaming man of joy. The release. He turned into just the most joyful person. The second example which comes immediately to mind to me is Will Young, who won singing competition Pop Idol in 2002 and essentially had to immediately come out to stop a tabloid newspaper from outing him. He's talked about being comfortable with his sexuality at the time and not actively hiding it, but the choice of how and when to publicly come out was taken from him. He never had the choice of whether or not he wanted to make a big announcement because he was backed into a corner. When asked more recently about the way he came out, the fact that he did it in a very understated way and the suggestion that he was, you know, confused about why it was seen as a big deal. Young had this to say. I wasn't confused by it, but I suppose my point was deliberately to not make a point about it. I thought that would be the most powerful thing to do in a way, turning it back on people and going, what's the big deal? I'm pleased I did that. I don't think it was easy. Now I look back on it. I did get a lot of abuse. I'm not quite sure how I managed to get through that really, but I suppose all gay people at that time were just used to getting abuse, so it wasn't like it was out of the blue. It's only now looking back on it, because times have changed, that I think, God, how awful for so many of us that we had to go through that. And it makes me even more proud to be gay and proud of my community. The nonchalance of his coming out, in other words, was manufactured as an armour against the outing itself. Even with his comfort in his sexuality at the time, and then the fact he was out, the industry still didn't fully accept him as a gay artist. He told an interviewer in 2018, I didn't know at the time, but when I was recording Leave Right Now, someone in the record company said I sounded gay and kept making me re-record the track. 
Young has also spoken about his struggles with his mental health, including anxiety and battling PTSD, which developed in part because of the experiences of hiding his sexuality as a teenager. He said, To feel gay shame is traumatic. I can pinpoint two times when I almost imploded. I didn't know what to do. You think, God, there's nothing worse than me because all the messages are, it's the most disgusting thing to be gay. You know how traumatic it is to be thinking, God, I shouldn't even be taking up space in this world. I hope it's getting better. And then while writing his book, To Be a Gay Man, Young emailed a conversion therapy provider in America pretending to ask for help. I said to them, I'm desperately ashamed of myself. Can you help me? Obviously they wrote back saying, we can definitely help you with this. No, you can't, you motherfucker. However much the world might be improving, there's still dangers to being queer, conversion therapy, violence, discrimination, and more. To come out is not as simple as some might like to think. You would hope that people within the queer community would understand the potential dangers, and yet we've gone from tabloid newspapers delivering these threats and speculation, to it coming from the community itself, or those professing to be allies online. How the hell did this happen? And what could be behind these campaigns to force people to come out? I think there are three main reasons we see pop up again and again when it comes to queer speculation. Either people speculating that a supposed straight celebrity is secretly queer, or that a celebrity like Connor who engages in queer art is definitely straight and using it for their advantage. Let's talk about the first reason, which is the most innocuous to begin. Part two, humour and self-identification. This is the most casual and kind of silly level of this discourse, although it isn't without its potential negative side effects. It's this fun, in-joke focused discussion of celebrities as secretly being queer, which is more about the queer community banding around allies or unsuspecting straights to claim them as our own. Nearly everyone engaging at this level of speculation doesn't really believe that the celebrity in question is in fact queer. Not only do they not really believe it, but they also don't really care. It might be about an element of identifying with that person's life story, you know, self-expression or their creative output. In this way, knowing that Hosea is totally a lesbian makes you feel included in a harmless bit of fun when nobody is the butt of the joke. The idea that these straight people give queer energy is not literally true, but it's also not really meant to be. So three quick examples of this that all spring from different places are one, the aforementioned Hosea is a lesbian joke. This can be applied to a lot of male singers. With Hosea, it's like, this man is giving goblin lesbians who seem like they emerge fully formed from a moss-covered forest floor the representation that they deserve. You can listen to songs that he sings about women and imagine yourself in that speaker's voice. His most famous song, Take Me to Church, has a ton of imagery that queer people can relate to. Oppressive relationships with religion, uh, dwelling on the concept of sin, admiring not just a woman's looks, but her sense of personality to humour and power. Two, Dolly Parton, whose campiness simply cannot be denied. The jokey idea that this high performance gender is giving femme lesbian is coupled with the fact that doing a queer analysis on her style and career is just fun. There's also an element of the gay icon about her, where straight women become rallying points for gay fandoms even before openly gay icons were widely possible. One reporter described it as obsessing over straight entertainers who were allies or perhaps seemed kind of queer or who were known to be family among certain other entertainers and fans, but not by the mainstream, were pretty much the only options. We might have more options now, but the tongue-in-cheek speculation lives on. The nudge and wink claiming of gay icons as part of the community was often tied to the idea of them sharing in our suffering in a tangential way in their own trauma, the idea that they understand us in a certain way. As writer Trevor Martin put it, the most noted and revered of gay men's icons are inevitably quirky or uncommonly beautiful and always talented. They portray a vulnerability that's often wrapped up in strength in the face of adversity. Lurking behind the glitz, they may have troubled personal lives. Perhaps their lives are tainted by emotional turbulence and sometimes a subtle sense of pathos filters out from just behind the eyes. And the third and final example in this section is Natasha Lyonne, the honorary lesbian. Like this actress played one of the most iconic lesbian characters on film in But I'm a Cheerleader and did it damn well. The fact that she's straight comes as a shock for many queer people. The joke is more, wait, she's straight? No, than any serious speculation about her harboring a secret sexuality. This phenomenon of actresses becoming lesbian icons is a process journalist Grace Perry broke down in four hilarious hypothetical steps. One, seemingly straight actor portrays queer character. Two, queer community thirsts over that queer character. Three, queer community transitions thirst for queer character to thirst for straight actor. Four, straight actor is deemed queer icon. 
and sometimes there's a 3B phase where a woman actor wears a suit on a red carpet. This level of queer claiming is good natured, but it does have its iffy moments. Not to bring us back to the days of Trump, but I think everyone remembers seeing at least one political cartoon implying that he and Putin were in a sexual relationship together. This joking speculation of homophobes being secretly gay in memes and tweets it's not the harmless provocation that it might seem at first. Ultimately, it does serve to annoy someone like Trump, but that's because it's using the idea of being gay as something inherently humorous, pitiable, or degrading. It also perpetuates this idea that all homophobes are secretly gay, and ultimately lets straight homophobes off the hook while doing nothing to stop the internalized homophobia that might contribute to queer people hating themselves and their own community in the first place. But ultimately, the examples in this section aren't really speculation as such. It's it's not a claim to the truth so much as a joke about it. So what happens when people get serious about these theories? Part three, the rhetoric of true believers. Okay, so it's finally time to talk about the big ones, Taylor Swift and Harry Styles, both successful musicians and less successful actors at the pinnacle of fame, but that's not all they have in common. Both Swift and Styles are at the center of fan conspiracy theories about their sexuality. If you spend time on the internet at all, I'm sure this isn't a surprise, but there is a not insignificant portion of fans who believe that their respected pop idol is in fact queer. Now I want to say from the off that it is fairly easy to queer the art of Taylor Swift and Harry Styles in a kind of English class analysis sort of way. Early Taylor Swift love songs frequently feature parents or society disapproving of the love in question, and you can see how that might well resonate with queer listeners. In the song Hours, Taylor promises to ignore her father's snide remarks about her partner's tattoos and reassures them, don't you worry your pretty little mind, people throw rocks at things that shine. Hours also features a love interest that's only referred to as you rather than he or boy or any other gendered indicators. This gender neutral language is actually pretty common with Swift throughout her discography. Later Swift songs frequently explore the challenges of keeping a relationship a secret, the feeling that everybody is watching you, judging you. King of my heart, dress, wonderland, ready for it, the lakes, question, I know places, are all love songs about a couple trying to avoid public speculation, often using a hunting metaphor or imagery of a crowded room whispering gossip. Obviously, it makes sense that a lot of queer Swifties did and still do identify with these songs. A lot of queer people struggle with disapproving parents, a hostile society, balancing authentic gender performance and desirability, secret romances and unwanted attention surrounding your relationship. But just because the lyrics can be read in a queer way, it doesn't necessarily mean that Swift herself is queer. The idea of wanting, needing to keep a relationship secret resonates with many queer people, for example, but it's not exclusive to us. You can see how a girl in the spotlight might sing about longing for privacy too. Harry Styles likewise has songs that queer people identify with. Matilda, which was inspired by the Roald Dahl book of the same name, has become a kind of found family anthem. The lyrics are almost tailor-made to be screamed by a queer 20-something healing their inner child. You can let it go, you can throw a party full of everyone you know and not invite your family because they never showed you love. You don't have to be sorry for leaving and growing up. Then there's the unreleased song Medicine that Harry Styles sometimes performs in concert, which features the lyric, the boys and girls are here, I mess around with them and I'm okay with it. Which, yeah, that's definitely one for the bisexuals. But more than his music, it's Styles' image that resonates with a lot of queer fans. Post One Direction, Styles embraced a more androgynous style, wearing pearl necklaces, skirts, and a dress on the cover of Vogue. During a Halloween concert, he dressed up as Dorothy in a blue gingham dress and ruby red slippers, the dress and the Dorothy nod feeling queer in equal measure to many. Alongside his stylist, Harry Lambert, Styles has created this playful, colorful, campy aesthetic that accentuates the vibe of his music. This image is part of the art, and the image resonates with a lot of queer fans. So clearly, it is very easy to engage with Harry Styles and Taylor Swift's music in a queer way, but it's honestly pretty easy to queer the art of countless straight artists. The queer community has been doing it for decades to get that sense of personal meaning from songs that were publicly available to listen to, aka straight songs. But unlike many of these other artists who have been embraced by the queer community, both Swift and Styles face a lot of rumors about their sexualities themselves. And these rumors, this queer speculation, 
began very early on in their careers. These theories about Taylor Swift really took off when she befriended Diana Agron, an actress most famous for playing Quinn for Bray on Glee. It was here that Swift Grong conspiracies were born. Agron became the first of Swift's friends that Gaylers think was actually a secret girlfriend, but she was far from the last. Taylor has been speculated to have dated her backup singer, a fiddle player in her band, Carly Kloss, and most recently, Zoe Kravitz. For Harry Styles, speculation about his sexuality is mostly tied to a specific alleged relationship. Larry's, as they're called, believe that Harry Styles is in a secret relationship with former One Direction bandmate, Louis Tomlinson. As a side note, uh, people who don't believe that Harry and Louis are together in reality, but like the idea of them as a couple in a very hypothetical fictional way, are also called Larry's. But for the rest of this video, when I use the term, it's going to refer to fans who do believe that at some point, Louis and Harry were a couple in real life or still are. Before I talk more about the speculation surrounding these artists, I want to point out that both Louis and Harry have publicly denied any romantic or sexual relationship multiple times. Louis Tomlinson in particular has gone out of his way to say that not only are these rumors not true, but that the speculation has made him deeply uncomfortable. In an article with Seventeen, Louis said that, a certain amount of fans dropped this conspiracy. It created this atmosphere between the two of us where everyone was looking into everything we did. It took away the vibe you get of anyone. It made everything, I think, on both fences a little bit more unapproachable. Stars has also talked about his desire to keep his private life, well, private, stating in an interview, I've been really open with it with my friends, but that's my personal experience. It's mine. Taylor Swift has also expressed discomfort and frustration with the constant speculation. At the height of the mainstream Taylor Swift Carly Kloss speculation, Swift tweeted, For my 25th birthday present from the media, I'd like for you to stop accusing all my friends of dating me. But despite the repeated denials by the very subjects of these theories, the Larry and Gayla believers haven't faltered. We're going to come back to the implications of this later in the video, but now I want to talk about where these rumours and speculations have come from. Both Gaylers and Larry's have a lot of evidence that they build their theories on. Fans intensely analyse tattoos, song lyrics, interviews, paparazzi photos, social media posts, outfits and more, and then share their analysis online. Popular ways of presenting this information would be creating relationship timelines, slideshows, analysis videos, and compilations, which get quite literally millions of views. A core tenet of gala rhetoric is the concept of Easter eggs. Swift has publicly confirmed multiple times that she leaves clues for her fans about her music or upcoming tours. These clues or Easter eggs appear in her music videos, her social media, even her fashion. Sometimes these Easter eggs take months to pay off. As a result, she's developed a reputation for being a bit of a mastermind. Many gaylers believe that Swift leaves similar Easter eggs about her sexuality. The pink blue color scheme of her album Lover, Obviously, Swift artistic mastermind wants you to know that she's bisexual. In the very first night, there's a lyric that goes, didn't read the note on the Polaroid picture, they don't know how much I miss you. But wait, you doesn't rhyme with picture. But you know what does rhyme with picture? Her. Obviously, the original lyric was meant to be, didn't read the note on the Polaroid picture, they don't know how much I miss her. Because Swift is way too good of a songwriter to not rhyme her chorus properly, right? Or look at how Taylor looks at Dita Von Tees in the Bejeweled music video. Obviously, this is intended to represent by panic, right? Plus, she wrote a song called Wonderland with lyrics like, to in love to think straight. And she knows that we know that Diana Agron has an Alice in Wonderland tattoo. Obviously, she wants fans to know that she and Diana are secretly in a romantic relationship. And so on and so forth. Larry compilations frequently feature clips of Harry and Louis interacting during concerts and in interviews. Most of it feels fairly harmless. It's a lot of plain old eye contact and casual physical affection and Harry and Louis saying nice things about each other. There's like a deep analysis of these two rainbow colored stuffed bears bought with them on tour, for example, but some of it is honestly genuinely disturbing. Like multiple Larry evidence slideshows and timelines feature sexualized underage images of Harry and Louis. There are close up gifts of Harry whispering to Louis that focus on Harry's tongue. There's a picture of Harry and Louis where, and there's no uh, like delicate way of saying this, they both appear to have stains on their jeans. And this image is followed by speculation as to what bodily fluid those stains might be. Again, these are pictures of them when they were teenagers. Like, yikes. I think part of the persistence is about this kind of confirmation bias, right? When we want to believe something, we overemphasize information that confirms our beliefs and tend to dismiss information that contradicts it. 
take this post from a Kayla blog analyzing a post from Carly Kloss's Instagram, for example. It's a photo of Taylor kissing Carly on the cheek. In the caption, Carly counts Taylor Swift as my friend, sister, partner in crime. The Tumblr analysis says, she no homo the out of it with her caption with the sister throw in, but I say the picture speaks for itself. This Tumblr user zeroed in on potential queer imagery in the Polaroid and dismissed the context of the caption as a red herring, as a line meant to throw people off the scent of their relationship. The thing that gets me about this is that clearly if they're trying to publicly confirm they aren't dating, even if it is a misdirect to protect their privacy, why would you then draw attention to how much you think it's a lie? Surely if you have the kind of compassion and respect for an artist that is claimed here, you wouldn't want to go against these implicit and explicit messages. You see, something that is consistent through much of the Gala fandom is that they don't really think that Swift is in the closet. They think that she's basically already told her fans that she's queer. In an article, writer Joe Packer wrote, For these fans, it's not that Gaylas are spies uncovering a secret that Swift wants hidden, but rather that Swift is trying to communicate her queerness to, and only to, a sympathetic audience capable of piecing together her hints. Or as one Tumblr post puts it, Gurley said, All right, I'll come out, but only to the people with good reading comprehension. On the other hand, most Larrys don't seem to believe that Harry and Louis exercise a similar level of control. In fact, a key element of these theories is that Harry and Louis are trapped under homophobic management. And then when they left One Direction, they like were under different homophobic management that works together to ensure that both of them stay closeted. Anything that contradicts this idea is dismissed as a hoax and then used as further proof that Larry is real. For example, when Louis Tomlinson announced that he was expecting a child, Larry fans immediately decided that this had to be a fake pregnancy. When Louis posted a photo of him holding his newborn son, people analyzed the lighting, the filter, the levels, the composition and declared that it was photoshopped. Paparazzi photos of Louis with his baby in a stroller were dismissed as Louis simply pushing around a realistic doll or being staged. And very quickly, the fake baby theory became further evidence that Larry was real. Like management figured out that the Larrys were onto their gay love affair, so they created a fake baby for Louis to really try and prove that he's straight. I wanna be clear here that this is a spectrum, right? So there are people who just casually are like, yeah, I mean, I, I've seen some of the evidence and I, I think it could be plausible that Taylor Swift might be queer all the way to the people who are going to look at like actual significant life events in these people's lives and be like, nope, this is a lie. I still believe what I believe. Like there is a spectrum. Girlfriends of both Harry and Louis have been dismissed as beards, meaningless affairs and PR relationships. I think it should be noted that a lot of the women seeing dating either of these guys received a lot of harassment from Larry fans because of this. Not even people on this extreme level, but like people over here in the spectrum as well. Secret relationship theories happen with heterosexual pairings as well. Uh, people like Tom Felton and Emma Watson or Millie Bobby Brown and Finn Wolfhart, for example. But none of these relationship speculations receive nearly as much intensity as Gayla or Larry. Because if you follow their logic, then if Gayla's believe that Taylor Taylor Swift wants her fans to know her sexuality, then not believing that she's queer is akin to deliberate ignorance or even erasure. If Larry's believe that Harry and Louis are trapped in the closet by their management, then they can imagine that queer speculation is a form of liberation for their idols. Queer speculation isn't a guilty pleasure or mere gossip, it's a moral act for fans. In one article, Aja Romano writes, any Larry Shipper will tell you that homophobia is the main reason Styles and Tomlinson are still in the closet. And one of the main reasons Larry Shippers are so vocal is that they hate the idea that these two men can't openly express their love. This feeling of moral righteousness led to a lot of toxicity within the fandom. After all, if Larrys are moral, then non-Larrys are immoral. In an interview with BuzzFeed, Caitlin Tiffany, author and retired One Direction fan said, The great tragedy of the One Direction fandom is that it ended up splintering because of conspiracy theories that were just divergent ideas of reality. Like that Louis Tomlinson and Harry Styles were secretly in love, or that Louis Tomlinson didn't really father a child. It eventually became a dark conspiracy that blamed the people around the boys, mostly women, for making them suffer. They weaponized social justice causes, so if you question the Larry Stylinson narrative, you could be accused of being homophobic. 
For the most part, there isn't a similar level of intensity in the Gaylor discourse. While Gaylors believe that Taylor hasn't explicitly come out because of homophobia within the music industry, they also believe that she is making that choice and not management. There's lower stakes in a way. Non-Gaylors aren't necessarily perceived as malicious or homophobic, just kind of oblivious. There is this phrase that's been gaining traction recently, real people can't queer bait, primarily in response to instances like Kit Connor's forced outing. I think it's an interesting one in regards to stars as famous as Styles and Swift, because because they are real people, but they are also brands. They have stylists and PR and management who are informing their public image. If queer baiting is about producers or companies using the aesthetics and subtext of queerness to get TV viewers, I don't think we can assume that music management isn't willing to do the same to sell albums, tours, and merch. But that connection between the brand and the artist is way closer than that of an entire TV show and any single person involved in the cast or crew. Calling out a show for queer baiting is talking about a single credit on a writer's IMDb page in regards to fictional characters. It's not tied to the actual identity of a real person. We don't know if Harry Styles' is stylist putting him in florals and nail polish is a true reflection of the real person within the brand image or entirely a fabrication for the singer's persona. But when accusations of queer baiting are leveled at the persona, they will inevitably affect the real person at the heart of it particularly if they are in fact queer and not wanting to be publicly out in that way. Because if the queer interpreted lyrics and acts of self-expression are coming from a closeted queer artist wanting to show and feel their queerness in a small way, using that to pull them out of the closet by force feels counterintuitive to real support. We talked earlier about singers like Stephen Gately who were made to be closeted by band management, even set up with famous women in PR relationships. So this isn't an idea that comes from nowhere. When it comes to actors or other celebrities in the realm of artistic fame, it used to be guaranteed to be a huge, potentially life-destroying scandal if you were gay. So if you were threatened with being outed, you were in a pretty rough situation. Conspiracy theories around celebrities secretly being gay was, for most of history, potentially the closest thing to the truth because they literally couldn't be out. There were absolutely queer musicians and actors back in the day in Hollywood who had to be closeted their entire careers, but these aspects of queer history History, like lavender marriages, remain a part of current conspiracies about potentially queer celebrities. A lavender marriage was a male-female mixed orientation marriage undertaken as a marriage of convenience to conceal the socially stigmatized sexual orientation of one or both partners. Marriages speculated to be of this nature in Hollywood included that of actor Rock Hudson and his secretary Phyllis Gates, who married in 1955 but then separated two years later after rumors of his sexuality and supposed infidelity grew to be too much. Nowadays, we also see so-called PR relationships cross the rumor mill of celebrity couplings, no queerness required. When we look up these relationships, you see a lot of hints at insider industry info and speculation. One article I read as research for this video has a section that reads, Superman Henry Cavill and Kaylee Cuoco's relationship suspiciously coincided with the release of Man of Steel. Cuoco dated her Big Bang Theory co-star Johnny Galecki privately for two years and suddenly she's flaunting her relationship? The couple were seen holding hands and buying groceries. Right. If we know these lavender marriages existed in history and that current heterosexual couples enter into fake relationships for the press, is it so wild to think that a homophobic industry might force queer celebrities into fake heterosexual relationships for their image? No, I don't think it's that wild at all. I can understand on some level the impetus behind the desire for these theories to be true. If you feel connected to this music, especially as a queer person, you feel like you know these people through their lyrics. You understand that the music industry can be homophobic and force artists to stay closeted. There is a kind of vindication, even a feeling of compassion in believing that you are seeing these secret hints that they are trying to send to true fans. And then add that to recently revealed evidence of corruption within the music industry from Kesha's mistreatment to the Free Britney movement, and you give validity to the potential behind some of these theories. However, it is also vital to acknowledge that there have been repeated and open requests by Swift, Styles, and Tomlinson to stop, and they have directly addressed their own discomfort Yet yeah, these conversations persist. For me, I think ultimately it doesn't matter if these people are queer or not. It doesn't matter if all of these things that you're picking up on are clues, if they're little hints, if they're things that point to the real truth because they've asked people to stop doing it. It doesn't matter if they're queer or not. That is besides the point. It matters that people have been asked to stop. 
There is a world of difference between critiquing the observable homophobia of an industry while supporting those who have come out with testimony about their struggles and using this knowledge of potential issues to speculate on individual sexualities and relationships while they are within that industry and not out and explicitly talking about not wanting that speculation to be happening. And this leads us to the third and final level of the question, why do people do this? Part four, moral superiority. The queer speculation around Kit Connor, or I guess the straight speculation, was not a joke or due to the stand level of true believers. It was all about proving a kind of moral superiority over him. The assumption at the heart of this speculation was that he is straight, as opposed to secretly queer, like in the examples of Swift or Styles. And ultimately, this has led to a queer teenager being forced out himself. And the most messed up thing is, I reckon a lot of people harassing him don't see that as evidence of their wrongdoing, but that what they did was justified because they were right. That's what's important. The harassment and pressure he felt seemed to stem from a kind of absolutist morality. That is an ethical view that any action we might make is intrinsically either right or wrong, regardless of context or nuance. For some people, there is a safety in this type of strict moral thinking. It might feel easier to go through the world and navigate different situations if you have a strong sense of right or wrong to do in any circumstance. But it can also give a sense of certainty that moves into a heightened sense of moral superiority. Not only do you know the right thing to do, but you feel able to judge those that stray from this because no matter their reasoning or what is happening in the wider context, it is always wrong. This type of thinking as it relates to queer speculation relies on a number of value judgments and assumptions to function. So in the example of Kit Connor, we have, all queer roles should be played by queer actors. Therefore, if someone takes a queer role that isn't queer themselves, this is wrong. But also, it is my duty as someone who understands this truth to ensure that it is being followed. And therefore, my bad treatment of an actor who might be flouting this truth is justified because them taking the role without being queer is worse. That first initial idea is not entirely without merit. If we take it in a more nuanced and open way, for example, the queer actors should have the opportunity to play queer roles, or that the connection with a character's experience and community can make a queer actor feel more authentic in a role, or even that the prevalence of straight actors who have been rewarded for playing queer roles in mainstream movies, including being awarded Oscars for portrayals of tragic queer stories, is a troubling trend. I can see where this absolutist framework comes from. Other marginalized communities have talked about similar issues with representation in the past. This includes whitewashing of black and Asian roles, where characters or real people portrayed in film were originally people of color and are replaced with white actors. Other examples in film even use black and yellow face to maintain the character's supposed race or ethnicity while a white actor was in the role. Even when the role was specifically significant because of their race, like Laurence Olivier's portrayal of Shakespeare's Othello, for example. We can see how this is something objectionable. As Leilani Nishime, professor of community communication at the University of Washington explains. There are so few representations of people of color in media, losing even one more hurts us. It also silences us, so we don't get to tell our own stories. Similarly, cis actors playing trans roles has been the norm for years, and is only just starting to be acknowledged as damaging to the community. There are very real and harmful stereotypes like the man in a dress attitude towards trans women, which are supported by this type of casting, and can have an effect on the attitudes of audiences with limited experience and exposure to authentic trans narratives. Trans actors are also historically extremely unlikely to be offered cis roles, limiting the opportunities given to them when even the small handful of trans roles go to cis actors. By that logic, having a straight person play a gay role seems to fall into this same trap, right? There are limited portrayals of queer people on screen, especially in these roles. And who hasn't cringed at straight actors on press tours for queer movies, making tone deaf remarks about how this isn't a gay story, it's a love story. But there is a practical difference between whitewashing and straight watching in reality. Although white passing does exist, for the most part, someone being black, for example, will either be evident from their looks or will be something that they can disclose reasonably easily. On an actor's resume, it will say things like eye color, age range, and playing type. That last one basically meaning what race or ethnicity can you play? Being queer, on the other hand, is not such an easy disclosure for many. Although we've made progress in the last few decades, coming out can still be a dangerous or scary process, even for those who want to take that step. The growing acceptance 
movement, I think, has made way for this attitude that coming out should be easy to do and that those in the public eye have an obligation to do it. They can be seen as symbols, as role models, rather than as people with their own private lives and struggles. They are seen to be made for our judgment and consumption. In this way, not only is it seen as a good thing to come out, but an actively bad, deceitful thing to stay in the closet. So when Kit Connor is cast in a leading role as a queer teen, we have the combining of these two ideas. One, that queer roles should always be played by queer characters, and two, that coming out is a moral obligation. That led to the harassment campaign against him. It isn't bullying or harassment because it's righteous justice. There is this idea that queer celebrities have an obligation to increase LGBTQ plus representation and, you know, help young queer people. Even more so if that celebrity is playing a queer character on screen and needs to authenticate their reason for playing them. But like, Kit Connor is a queer young person. He is a queer teen. How is it helping queer youth at all to try and force him to come out or admit that he's like being deceitful and taking a role away from a queer person? If celebrities, actors and public figures are given the space to come out at their own pace and timing, surely it's more likely to lead to them feeling comfortable, accepted and ready, even excited to be part of the community and even more likely to want to share that journey with others, to actively want to be the kind of role models that we seem to be seeking with this behavior. This pressuring people to come out, playing with a kind of justified vigilante morality system is the opposite of what the industry needs. There is no surer way to stop queer creatives from wanting to come out and make art about their lives and experiences than treating them this way. This policing needs evidence and the evidence that you can find about public figures that you don't know is always going to be limited to what they feel comfortable showing or is gained through the overstepping of boundaries. This supposed evidence itself then furthers problematic narratives, encouraging assumptions based on things like gender nonconformity or the gender of your partner as if straight men can't wear florals or bi men can't date women. Public bisexual life in this way is being seen as queer baiting by those with biphobic attitudes to identity. Kit Connor's co-star Joe Locke has commented on the speculation saying, the idea of a tabloid being interested in a teenager's love life is really gross. Someone making money out of rumors about who I, an 18 year old boy, might be liking or talking to, it's really gross and perverted. I'm 18, I don't know who I am yet. I don't think that actors should be forced to come out in order to play a queer character they feel a connection with, whether they are a teenager or an adult, because it isn't just that Kit Connor is a kid. This kind of speculation, judgment and harassment can be traumatic whatever your age. Possibly the most notable example of this outside the world of acting is a case of Becky Albertalli, who wrote the book that Love, Simon the movie is based on. Becky Albertalli was accused of queer baiting after having written several YA novels which centered around LGBTQ plus teenagers, despite not at that point having told the world how she identified. Becky is married to a man, but obviously this doesn't necessarily say anything about someone's sexuality. So as a result of the subject matter of her books, alongside the apparent confirmation of her heterosexuality based on honestly the assumption that if she hadn't said anything about her sexuality, she must be straight, some criticized her for lacking the authority to write stories about LGBTQ plus lives. I was frequently mentioned by name, held up again and again as the quintessential example of Alois's het inauthenticity. She's written about the experience. I was a straight woman writing shitty queer books for the straights, profiting off of communities I had no connection to. Things further came to a head in the 2018 release of the film Love, Simon, which sparked an overwhelming scrutiny of her personal life and even calls for boycotts of her work. In a 2018 article with The Advocate, for example, Abatali said she identified with Simon because he is a theatre kid who is full of secrets and piecing together how to grow up. Quotes from this from her were used as evidence of her heterosexuality especially for those who were co-opting the hashtag Own Voices on Twitter. The Own Voices hashtag had its origins in the bookish side of the internet and was meant to highlight stories about communities that were told by an author within that community. A little extra label to potentially reassure a reader if the book tackled nuanced community issues or if they were just interested in expanding the types of authors that they read. However, it soon became used as a weapon against any author seen to be writing outside of their own experiences. And the discourse surrounding the Own Voices hashtag 
hashtag was the ultimate catalyst for Albertalli's coming out, the demand for an author and protagonist to match identities was something that Albertalli has said caused harm to herself and others, however unintentional. There is this real sad sense of irony in that Albertalli was herself on a coming out journey as she wrote about the coming out processes of her characters. She said, My understanding of bisexuality as a concept didn't entirely track with how I see it now. For one thing, the idea of sexual fluidity wasn't even on my radar, and there didn't seem to be a word for girls who basically liked guys but were sometimes randomly fascinated by girls. Because of this lack of LGBTQ plus representation and education in her life, Abatali has said, She edited out all the parts that refused to make sense, including her bisexuality. In fact, the epiphany about her sexuality didn't fully come to fruition until she was writing Leia on the Offbeat, a YA novel about a love story between two girls. Using writing and art to explore your own identity or questions you don't yet have the answers to is a powerful thing, but it's something that was ultimately taken away from Abatali by this pressure to come out, tying her journey of self-discovery forever with a kind of coerced and defensive confession. Coming out has the potential to be liberating, but instead she described it like this. This doesn't feel good or empowering or even particularly safe. Honestly, I'm doing this because I've been scrutinized, subtweeted, mocked, lectured and invalidated just about every day for years and I'm exhausted. And if you think I'm the only closeted or semi-closeted queer author feeling this pressure, you haven't been paying attention. She's also talked about the way that what might feel like individual posts online can add up, especially when people are making statements about someone in the public eye who has access to these messages. Just a reminder that interesting community discourse isn't just discourse when it directly targets an actual human person, while inflicting massive collateral damage on a group of people who are fairly likely to be in a position where they can't even speak about it. This is so personal personal and so traumatic and I'm begging you to stop. On Instagram, using her own page, she has posted genuinely heartbreaking messages, clearly affected by the impact of these discussions. These intense emotions I think we've just seen echoed in Kit Connor's coming out tweet, writing captions like, hey, can we talk? Believe it or not, I'm a really private person and I hate going live by myself, but I'm feeling really desperate to be seen as a person right now and I legitimately don't know what else to do. A sense of moral policing was clearly part of the criticism and harassment against Albertalli, the idea of a kind of purity of consumption. I only read these kind of books that have passed this special test. And if you don't follow this rule, you're a bad person. And if you're the one writing books that break this rule, you're even worse. It takes an idea that could do a lot of good that marginalized authors should be given more opportunities in an industry that is still lacking in terms of representation and applies it with an absolute morality model that misses out on vital nuances. I wanna talk about a final example in this section, Jamila Jamel, an actress and model who has been outspoken about issues she cares about for years and has caught a lot of flack because of it. I think she's long suffered from this idea that people who are seen to try in the public eye come under much more scrutiny than those who don't seem to give a shit at all. She was selected to be a judge on the HBO Max show Legendary, a reality show which focused on the world of queer ball culture. As soon as the announcement was made, people were on the attack. How dare Jamil take this judging position, this straight woman who clearly knows nothing about this world. Soon after, Jamil did an interview with the Times and officially came out saying, I guess I'm bisexual, but also quite fancy everyone. I don't know if that means that I'm pansexual, but I don't just fancy cis straight men, I fancy everyone. In a since deleted tweet, she said, this is absolutely not how I wanted to come out. There, to my mind, is a reason why including closeted and questioning people as part of the queer community is so vital, and not just as a forgotten couple of letters in an acronym. It takes conscious thought and effort to ensure that there are spaces that include these people, that they are met with compassion, resources and understanding rather than condescension or vitriol. The community has been burned before by cishet people and companies profiting from us without giving back, but the desire to keep queer projects Projects pure and separate cannot come at the expense of some of the most vulnerable people in our community. The possibility that a rogue cishet might sneak into a role in our representation is worth it to keep questioning and closeted people safe from harassment and outing. Otherwise, we have a situation where you need to admit to being queer, or you need to come out as a kind of penance or punishment, or you need to out yourself as the only thing you can do to avoid harassment, even if you would be happier or safer in the closet. It almost feels like those old stories of witch trials, you know, if you aren't a witch, don't worry, we'll just test it, sit on this stool, we'll tie you up and dunk you. If you are a witch, you'll float and then we'll burn you. Oh, if you aren't a witch, don't worry, we won't burn you. You'll just 
drown instead. The reasons why people take on these absolutist morality viewpoints are varied. For some, it's comforting to have a set of rules you can apply to every scenario and feel that they are in the right. For others, they feel a kind of anger at people who are safe in their supposed secrecy. This feeling of jealousy, I guess, of, you know, I had to go through this trauma of coming out and being out. My life is harder because of my sexuality. Why don't you have to go through that? There's also, of course, that parasocial element, thinking that you know this person or are owed their private thoughts and identity because of that. These things mix together to justify harassing people for taking up queer space while supposedly not being queer, or conversely to critique people for not coming out and not doing it sooner when they are secretly gay because of some obligation to fans. This parasocial element is also why I think there seems to be a higher rate of speculation and shipping amongst celebrities whose careers give them a balance of accessibility and privacy. Actors like Clay Blanchett, Rachel Weisz and Natasha Lyonne may have played queer characters but they aren't as speculated about as, say, YouTubers or musicians who are more likely to make content or songs about their own lives and be available to meet in person at concerts or events. Actors where their personal lives have been connected to the characters, like the cast of Heartstopper, or where viewers have physical access to them, like the cast of Supernatural and other shows that gather fans in person at events like conventions or meet and greets, seem more likely to have this kind of discourse around them. Those that engage in it often feel a sense of entitlement around these public figures. I think the replies in one Twitter thread I saw after KitCon is coming out demonstrate the differing points of view of people engaged in this discourse pretty well. People getting up in arms about being queer baited by people feels a lot like the old friend zoned era. People don't owe you anything based on your perception of them, let alone actual celebrities you don't know. Sure, but the arguments around queer baiting are far more nuanced. People are dying around the world for the right to be out. It's an affront to their lives and to activism when someone uses queerness as a marketing tool. You don't know they're using queerness for marketing. You're making an assumption about people you don't know. People dying for coming out doesn't mean anyone has to come out if they don't want to. You're not entitled to anyone's sexuality, period. There is something dangerous about the idea that because queer people are suffering to extreme degrees around the world, any lesser queer suffering is unimportant. The idea that it's an insult to complain or want to be closeted when other people have it worse than you is so dismissive. You wouldn't tell a queer person who has found happiness that some queer people have it better than them and feel happier so they don't have the right to be happy at all. Yet this misplaced morality citing extreme suffering in a conversation around a teenager's sexuality is exactly what we're talking about here in regards to the moral superiority being key to many people's feelings of justification in their speculation and even in their active outing. Part 5. The Harm the effect of queer baiting accusations and queer speculation about people in real life have been vast and consequential. Not only the harm from the pressure to be outed, but also the harm after and the wider effects on the community. When these conversations begin around celebrities, they are public discourse that anyone can stumble across. That means that the attitudes presented can also have an effect on bystanders. Comments made about one stranger online can also affect other strangers online. Any pressure or judgment thrown out against a public figure that you think Thing doesn't even read their social media mentions is also pressure and judgment directed, even unintentionally, towards more vulnerable members of our community. One of the things that I worry about most is how this public discourse might affect how people interact with questioning or closeted people in their own lives, potentially creating a culture of everyday speculation that can be hugely damaging, or popularizing the idea that not coming out is an inherently bad or dishonest or deceitful thing. I've had conversations with more than one friend in person about how the accusations of queer baiting and bi erasure from recent months have affected them. For some, the negative feelings come from these online discussions solidifying their own self-doubt, whether they're queer enough, whereas for others it highlights the ignorance that can still exist even within the queer community. Kate Baskerville wrote, The issue is that by calling them queer baiters, we're also telling other people who haven't found a label, or who may not identify with a label, that their expression of sexuality is wrong. Sexuality, like gender, is fluid and only ours to understand and express. It's deeply personal and often more complicated than fitting the binary of being heterosexual or homosexual. Shawn Mendes is another example of someone in the music industry where a number of fans continue to speculate that he is in the closet. Speaking to Rolling Stone about when he was accused of being too feminine, Mendes has said, I thought, you f guys are so lucky I'm not actually gay and terrified of coming out. That's something that kills people. That's how sensitive it is. Maybe I am a little more feminine, but that's the way it is. That's why I'm me. These conversations often end up reinforcing stereotypes, limiting people's self-expression and curtailing their freedom to explore themselves. 
Gender nonconformity, especially for men, is linked to sexuality so tightly in these rumors and speculation. Florals, painted nails, outward shows of emotion even, are all seen as evidence of queerness, which only serve to limit LGBTQ plus and cishet people alike. If someone is queer and their own self-expression aligns with gender nonconformity, then just expressing that in a muted way runs the risk of outing them. These all or nothing black and white attitudes to sexuality also encourage the kind of bio erasure that leads people to accuse someone like Kit Connor of queer baiting for simply holding a girl's hand. Apparently these people had not even considered that he could be bisexual, even while he is literally playing a bisexual boy in the show that introduced him to these speculators in the first place. Like it couldn't be more there. The speculation is binary, either admit you're gay or you're straight. There is no room or consideration by these fans that you could be bisexual or pansexual otherwise queer. Again, not giving bisexual or queer people any agency to explore their identity, as well as invalidating their identity if they do express their sexuality wrong. Maybe, again, a theme of this video, the speculation and judgment itself might be the problem. Because this kind of in-depth theorizing goes further than forced outing, Camila Cabello and Lauren Haregi from Fifth Harmony were speculated to be in a secret queer relationship for years. Just like Larry's or Gayla's, Carmen Shippers made timelines, slideshows, and compilations of moments between the two of them that proved their relationship. But after Fifth Harmony broke up, Haregi came out as bisexual. Fans were wrong about her and Cabello being together, but they were right about her being queer. In an interview last year, she commented on the harm that the Carmen ship had done, not just to her relationship with Cabello, but also to interactions with women she has to this day. That made me so uncomfortable, like disgustingly uncomfortable, because I was queer, but she was not. And it made me feel like a predator because of the types of clips people would put together and the stories they would write. I was always the aggressor but I did not have that connection with her. She goes on to say that the experiences made her hyper analyze every connection that I have with a girl because I don't want to make them feel like I'm looking at them in that way. It was so traumatizing. It really fucked with my head because I wasn't even comfortable telling my parents about it. I wasn't even comfortable telling myself that I was queer. And also I didn't see Camilla that way. So it made me uncomfortable that I could potentially be putting off that vibe. This is so indicative of the predatory lesbian trope that can also be used against bi women, an idea that we see in pop culture and social attitudes through the years of the older, more experienced lesbian turning or preying on younger, more innocent straight girls. It's the same idea that feeds into the lesbophobic ideas of lesbians being lecherous, dangerous, scary, possessive, and interested in preying on unwitting girls. And these ideas can absolutely prevent lesbians from engaging with their own identity and community without adding the pressure of people commenting on the possibility on the internet publicly for hundreds and thousands of people to look at. I know more than a few lesbians who have been bullied, harassed, even assaulted for even looking at a straight girl, doing the kind of harmless flirting that is not aggressive at all, but is interpreted that way because of their identity. And it kind of breaks my heart that that was something that someone has been made to go through on such a massive scale. It's worth reiterating something that we've talked about throughout this video here. Outing can still be dangerous. We've come far in terms of queer safety and rights in the past few decades, but it's still not a utopian world, even for celebrities who have a level of financial or social security. Feeling you have the right to out someone in this pressurized way, in a way where the person isn't ready yet, minimizes how hard coming out can still be. If the same idea moves from speculating about those in the public eye to those in personal social circles, the dangers and pressures may be even greater. After all, if you think you have the right to speculate or even outright out someone you don't even know, that entitlement can very easily shift onto someone that you have a more personal connection to. There's a real sense of dehumanization that flows from this. These people cease to be people and become hypotheticals, caricatures to project stereotypes and speculation onto for entertainment or internal moral satisfaction. And I think anything that encourages the dehumanization of anyone, including rich pop stars, is something to be questioned. Not to mention that for those who are not already out in their private life, this is potentially their first entry into the queer community at all, meaning it wasn't on their own terms, which to put it lightly, 
doesn't create the ideal environment or circumstances by which to begin to explore a community that should be full of support and solidarity. Queer speculation ultimately is going to help encourage outing, either making celebrities feel like they need to out themselves or incentivizing media to out celebrities. We're perpetuating the demand that I talked about at the start of the video that outrage criticized and that musicians like Will Young and Stephen Gately had to suffer through. It was only this year that comedian Rebel Wilson was threatened with being outed by a gossip columnist, Andrew Hornery, in the Sunday Morning Herald. He coerced her into coming out by giving her just two days to comment before he would publish an article with details about her relationship with jewelry designer Ramona Agruma. Rather than allow the article to talk for her, Wilson posted on Instagram, trying to have some semblance of control over the narrative, but the post captioned, I thought I was searching for a Disney prince, but maybe what I really needed all this time was a Disney princess, alongside rainbow hearts and hashtag love is love. The horrible irony being that the post itself garnered press coverage either way, and we have no idea if Wilson was ready for that kind of scrutiny and publicity about something that until then, she had not entered into the public eye. Part six, where do we go from here? I do understand the impetus behind these feelings of righteous anger. Queer people have a lot to be angry about and queer rage is a valid emotion to feel. I think especially when you're young, there is very little you have power over and even less that you can safely show your anger towards. It doesn't surprise me that some people can get caught up in expressing that frustration towards celebrities who seem removed from being real people. Not only can rightful anger directed at the wrong target still feel righteous, but it often connects you with people feeling that same pain and anger and consequently can make you feel less alone. But it can also encourage these same feelings of negativity as your expression of it leads to positive associations of camaraderie and justice. But that's because it's easy to be distanced from the other side of that harassment. The person who is targeted against, who often has done nothing to justify the level and volume of abuse that they face. There is great power in queer rage, but it feels wasted on the pressuring of someone like Kit Connor into coming out, or even an actually straight actor into apologizing for not being queer. There are so many queer issues that could use motivated and energized people putting in the work to make life actually measurably better for queer people. And I'd encourage anyone who is feeling these kinds of negative, overwhelming emotions to see if turning them towards tangible, positive change might ultimately make them feel better in the long run while doing some real world good in the process. In terms of those artists that gather conspiracies around them being secretly queer, like Taylor Swift and Harry Styles, like you can have queer interpretations of straight produced art. That's allowed. The author is dead, baby. You don't have to justify your connection with their music by deciding that they themselves have to be queer. You get to decide a song is super queer to you without it meaning the artist themselves has to be too. Maybe one or the other of them will come out as queer at some point, but right now there are so many openly queer artists worthy of support who are actually singing about queer love and queer experiences. Girl in Red, Lil Nas X, Janelle Monet, Hayley Kiyoko, King Princess, Tegan and Sarah, to name just a few. Plus dozens of up and coming artists that you can find on music apps or through TikTok where your support is even more meaningful. I can't help but speculate on the emotional impulses that feed these theories, the desire for community that leads so many to the world of fandom, but which can run headlong into a kind of mob mentality. The harassment of these actors and musicians, fueled by queer anger at the apparent safety and success that they hold, the vindictive jealousy, the loving adoration, the misplaced empathy. Some of those dissecting lyrics and videos and interviews spent hours and hours developing these theories, and I honestly want to see what could happen if they use their powers for good instead of evil, like Genuinely, we could solve some murders, Poirot style, you know? I guess the thought that I'm ultimately left with is that if you are harassing someone online or God forbid in person or posting things that could pressure someone to come out that could make them feel bad for the journey that they are currently going on, that can take away their agency when they are discovering and expressing their own sexuality or gender identity. Even if your theories are true and Harry Styles and Taylor Swift and Natasha Lyonne will make a joint announcement tomorrow that they're queer, it doesn't matter. It doesn't suddenly all become justified because ultimately protecting queer people who aren't out will always be more important than exposing potential queer baiting. And it's certainly more important than a desire to prove yourself as some kind of morally righteous judge of strangers' lives and identities. Thank you so much for watching. These were just my thoughts. Please let me know what you think in the comments. Thank you so much for watching. 
These are just my thoughts. I would love to hear what you have to say in the comments. Please keep it respectful. I'm sure that you will. And if you would like to support me and my work, there are a couple of ways you can do it. Uh, one would be to buy my book, Here and Queer. The links are in the description. Uh, it is a growing up guide for queer girls. Very fun, joyous, inclusive, lots of beautiful illustrations from the illustrator Jackie Sheridan. And the other is to check out my Patreon. I have a ton of really cool perks and I will leave all the info for those below along with all my social media so you can find me all over the internet. And until I see you next time, bye.